Welcome to another menopause.com podcast. Today, you're going to meet someone really special. Her real name says it all, Kelly Tuff. She's perhaps best known as Playboy Playmate of the Month in October 1981 and was a member of the Singing Playmates. Mm -hmm. But she had a challenging childhood and her life after Playboy would have destroyed most people. But like her name, she's tough and she survived and she thrived. And now she's here to tell us her story. So welcome, Kelly Tuff. Hi. Nice to Kelly, uh, you, Hi. You, you look great. And, and we're going to talk about what's behind you because that is just the uh, amazing artwork that you have created. And, and we're going to talk you. about that. But first, we want to talk about that, that the Playboy times in i believe it's 1980 to 82 83 82 83, 83, 83. Yeah. and you you obviously as larry said you were the playmate of the month which mm -hmm. is pretty good for you know there's a lot of women out there but you made it and yeah. tell us how you got there i was actually uh, 17 and i was working underage in a nightclub out in langley and the owner of the nightclub asked us to go to Timmy's telethon to donate some money on behalf of the, the bar I was working in and to prom promote the bar. It was called the King Tuts out in Langley. <laughs> and I met this, this short balding man that looked like he'd slept in his suit for three days. I wasn't and, there. What are you talking yeah. about? You're not short. <laughs> yeah, Larry, yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ken honey, but that's who it was. Uh -huh. And he, he came and I was, he, he came up to me and he said, I he was waving his card and he said, I work for Playboy and, and I think you should, I can get you in the magazine. And I was really insulted. And I looked at this guy and I says, what kind of girl do you think I am? I, I would never do anything like that. And I didn't realize that the, the outfit that they, they gave us to wear was I could crunch it up and hold it in my hand that it was a little <laughs> white jersey Cleopatra style with a gold rope around the waist and, <laughs> and and it was short short right and um anyway I just I I shuffed him off and the next day or the next night he showed up at the club and I got the bar to or the the um the doorman to ask him to leave and he showed up the night after that wow. and uh he kept he was harassing me right and then he showed up uh one more night and said that he said look he said if you don't believe i'm a photographer i said i know i believe you're a photographer i just don't want to do playboy right and he says well i've got another job for you i've got for skill chainsaw he said would you be interested in that paid i think back then it was like 200 bucks and i says yeah okay so he picked me up at my mom's house i was staying at my mom's and asked me, um, and he had Dorothy Stratton's magazine sitting on the on the seat between us. And I said, I used to go to school with her because I went from hmm. kindergarten to grade 11 with Dorothy. Wow. And yeah, I, we were both kind of, um, she was real shy and quiet and um, school, I, I, I went there, but I didn't socialize at school much. And uh, I said, I, I grew up with her. And he said, you know her? I got her in the magazine. I got her in the magazine. And he got her to phone me. And um, she's the one who convinced me to try out for the magazine. Mm -hmm. So we did some test shots, but I wouldn't do any nudes. I just did, wore a see-through blouse. And we sent them in and they phoned within a couple of days after receiving the pictures. So um, they flew me down and I was, I forged my mom's signature because I was you're still, you're still 17 at this 17. Point. Yeah. 17. Yeah. Underage. Yeah. You had to have your parents' signature. So I forged mm -hmm. my mom's signature and um, flew down there. It was the first time on a plane, the first time away from Coquitlam. And my, I, I said to my friends, well, what am I going to talk to Mr. Hafner about? And he says, well, I don't, just tell him like, smart things like tell him when he asks where you're from just say coquitlam and it means salmon swimming upstream right <laughs> I, said that too. Just, I called him mr hafter for the first six months i was there he goes please darling call me half and uh yeah it was pretty it was it was so neat it so was, what's that process then here you are you're 17 you're nervous uh really not, nervous not i was like a house plant sure. the first yeah. two weeks i was there i didn't yeah. talk what's to what's it like what i mean what was the process of him sort of introducing himself and incorporating you into the into the family well I, I only met him once before i went to the studio and then um 
he, he just, the, one of the secretaries came and got me from upstairs and said, come down and meet half. And he, he introduced himself and he, he's just, he's such a, he was such a wonderful man. Like he, he always said, darling, a darling, you look beautiful, darling, you look, <laughs> and um, then they sent me to the studio to do pictures, to, to test, to be, a, they called it a gatefold, right? And um, so I got, I gotten in this deep without doing nudes, right? <laughs> and when I got there, I really wanted to do this, but I was so painfully shy, believe it or not, because of the abuse I'd suffered when I was younger, I didn't see myself as pretty at all, at all. And as a matter of fact, I, if I had to take my clothes off, I, I never looked at myself in the mirror. Boyfriend I had, the lights were always out. And so I was terrified about doing these pictures. So the first day they sent me to the studio and they put on my hair and my makeup and the lighting and gave me this little tiny nothing to wear and a robe and sent me out on the studio and I burst out crying and my makeup artist <laughs> went, no, 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 no. Oh, and it's no. like I got in a car accident when I cry, right? My eye, I mean, it takes me a day to recover. My eyes go in little slits and a big vein down my forehead. And so they said, no, no, don't worry about it. It's okay. We'll try again tomorrow. So I went back the next day and did the same thing. So I was just beside myself. I'm going, I, I can't believe it. she They go, well, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. I said, no, 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 I, I want to, I want to. And I got to shoot with Mario Caselli, who was oh, famous, the best. Yeah, yeah. He got all the shy girls. And actually, um, I think I was one of the last centerfolds he shot because Dorothy got murdered when I was right. down, right? And he didn't shoot any more center. Him and Dorothy were really close. And so, yeah, the third day he sent me out onto the set and he cleared the set, got rid of all this help and said, um, gave me a glass of wine and okay, well, just drop your robe. And I, so I dropped the robe to my waist and then I couldn't open my eyes. And <laughs> it took all, all day, but he got some shots and they, they said, no, no, it went really good. And I didn't think it did. And so they phoned me the next morning, asked me to come down to the studio and they showed me the pictures and I'll never forget this as long as I live. I looked at those pictures and I couldn't believe that was me. I, I, it was like this big weight was lifted off my shoulder that I, that I'd been carrying around about how bad I felt about myself. And because back then we didn't have the child abuse hotline or Donahue or, or Oprah. I mean, we, it wasn't talked about. Right. Right. And uh, so if, if it wasn't for Playboy, I, I don't know what what would have happened to me really you know because i was so, at a real no, it was a real I, positive thing it was a super positive yeah uh -huh. I, I was still always shy but not not like I, I i felt different about myself and they're they're so good to the girls they they take care of us like and they do our taxes and make sure everything is um even our mail when i started getting mail and after my centerfold came out they said your mail's here i said mail and i i went down to the the kitchen and it was a two big garbage bags full of mail and I go well who's it from and it's mostly <laughs> from um pubescent boys and college boys <laughs> right guys in jail <laughs> but they go through the mail for you so that you don't get any nasty stuff, stuff. Right, yeah right, right. yeah they, like they really oh, take care that's so them. interesting I mean and for you to have a positive experience you know oh, um, that's great yeah. So yeah. tell us about a little bit about Hef. I mean, you lived at the mansion for a couple of years. And I was that before lived, or after? It was, at, well, actually, they, they, they got those pictures and they said that um, Hef has a meeting at the end of the month and that's where he okays the centerfold or he doesn't like the, likes the girl, but doesn't like the set or likes the set and then doesn't like the girl. Anyway, you're notified at the end of the month, right? Hmm. And then they phoned me and said, yep, you've been accepted. And I says, great. So they sent me a check for, it was 10,000 we got back then. So they sent me a check for 2000. Oh. And then I waited and waited and waited. And, and where were you when you were waiting? I was back, back home in, in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And and so nobody believed me, right? They go, well, if you got <laughs> accepted, then why aren't you down there? And I'm like, I don't know why I'm not down there. And so they, um, eight months went by and what they, what was happening at the time I, I found out later was they you get a thousand dollars finder's fee back then for getting a girl in the magazine and they allowed all the staff to do that too so 
all these girls were piling up and I was one of the first, right? So um, they phoned me about eight months later and asked me, she goes, it's Mickey Garcia from Playboy. I want to ask you, can you sing? And I went, yes, I can sing. <laughs> really? Could you? Just, or Well, I, 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 I don't know, right? I didn't know. I just said yes, because I well, just, I went down there not doing any nudes too, right? So I'll just, I'll just fake it till I make it, right? That's right. what I was thinking. And then I went down and uh, tested for the, the singing playmates and got accepted. I sang You Are My Sunshine. It was my song. I could do <laughs> all the words too, right? And I was in the group for um, almost a year before. And, and, and Heidi Sorensen was in the group. Um, Michelle Drake, Lorraine Michaels, Sandra Theodore, and Gina Tomasino. And they were all, the, their centerfolds all came out. I was the only one. And I says, and uh, at that time, I, I met Sandra Theodore and um, her and I clicked and we were really close. So that I was got, half's I, girlfriend. That right? was half's girlfriend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's a train wreck, but, but at the time I would anyway, so her and I were really close. So we, we worked together and then we went back to the mansion and we partied and, and I got to know half really well through that. And you're and still I, 17, I, right? No, no, I was 18 by then almost. Oh, okay. Cause I was, I was, I was 19 when it, when it actually came two years it took for it to come out right wow mm -hmm. yeah I shot it no, November 79 and it came out October 81 so 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 do you think so now you're back and you're kind of like uh in the club now right I mean you're part a part of that and so how did that progress from sort of being a newbie to really being involved uh, particularly with Hef himself how did that happen um, because I was so close to Sandra that, um, and I actually only lived at the mansion for about six months. And um, I started seeing, uh, I think it was Jimmy Van Patten. And I would, he picked me up for a couple of dates and Hef had mentioned to me, he goes, you know, um, I heard you got in quite late last night and you were a little impaired. And I'm like, I looked at him, I thought, it's not my dad, right? Like, and I said, <laughs> Sandra, why is he, like, he's your boyfriend. Why is he? bugging me about what time I came in last night and so him and I had a little bit of an argument and I said and I moved out Sandra let me move into her condo in Westwood when Westwood was nice mm -hmm. yeah yeah for the riots remember right, yeah, it was yeah. a beautiful like it was a really nice condo I used to walk down to, down there to have pizza and then after those riots I mean I killed those poor people that own that, all that property I feel sorry for them it just went to to you yeah. can say it Shit. Yeah, shit. I just went to shit, right? Yes. After those, the Rodney, it was Rodney King, right? Right, right. Yeah. So, so were you um, uh, now, uh, you know, uh, so what we understand there was some intimacy between you and oh, yeah, as well, right? They used to joke they were going to put another sink in upstairs in the bathroom for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, we, we were, we were close, but he was, um, at, at the time, him and Sandra. I was there for the last two years that they were together and um, she wasn't, she was just a mess. Right. And drugs, lots of drugs and lots oh. of drinking. She, she drank quite a bit and just want to clear the record for the whole time that I, that I knew half he smoked pot, but I never saw him do cocaine. I never saw him um, use any other illicit drugs and he never pushed it on us. Sandra wanted it all the time. And was it, was it available he, at the mansion? Um, no. And if you did it at there, you had to be really discreet about it. Nobody, did, if anybody did it out in the open, they were escorted off the property. Mm -hmm. Right. It just uh, out of respect. Yeah. He's a, well, he's a businessman too. He's not stupid. You know, he built this empire and that can take him down in a heartbeat. So yeah. yeah. But, you know, that's the way everybody did drugs back in the day. You were yeah. you know, discreet when about we, it. When we went to pick it up, he'd have um, security follow us, too, so that in case we got pulled over or anything happened, right, that we were we were taken care of. But hmm. it was never anything. He It was always Sondra that asked for it. And that's how I started doing it. And So you, you said you had an argument with Hef. What's an argument with Hugh Hefner like? <sighs> um. I only that's the only time I've ever seen him angry and he, and he wasn't very angry right he just I was he the disappointed dad well he was like the jealous <laughs> boyfriend a little bit and oh, I, wow. I didn't really yeah and I didn't really get that because the the arrangement was um 
I was there when I wanted to be. And, and as I started, as I felt more comfortable around the people, because when I went there, I didn't know anybody, like anybody. And then as um, the months passed and I felt more comfortable and I said to Sandra, I says, like, why does nobody ask me out? Right. And nobody's asked me out. And she said, oh, well, you know, you don't want to go out with any of the people that come up here anyway. And I was out in the game room one night and I was I overheard some people talking and the guy said something about asking me out. And he says, no, I don't, you don't want to do that. That's Hef's private stock. Oh. And oh. So I mentioned that to oh. him when he when he, uh, when he was disciplining me I guess about staying out late and who I was seeing because Sondra had gone out with James Van Patten I think or at before that and so there was he didn't like the Van Patten boys but he had to so they were still <laughs> he was just looking for an excuse to let, not that let them up and I was friends with a few of them back in the yeah. day yeah. right yeah. around that he was going out with Nels I think. <laughs> my yeah. wife went out with Nels weird yeah Forward, yeah right? yeah well, and had you been had you been sexually involved with him when mm -hmm. that incident occurred? Yeah. No, so, with Jimmy? No, with a half. Half. Yeah, I have. So I mean, it, it sounds to me like it was a, funny because that when the, the first the first time it happened, um, we were up in the in the bedroom, <laughs> and oh, my friend, and I I wanted to leave. It was the, the night was over, and I said, well and he ordered food and I says well how am I going to get back down to my room and he says well just walk down to your room and I said I don't want anybody to see me and he goes and I said I don't I don't want to hurt your feelings I just don't want people to think that I'm sleeping with you they just don't need to know my business can you tell them to just hold off on your food right so <laughs> they gave me a, a white robe to wear and I snuck down to my room and I thought, oh, I made it. I made it. Nobody saw me leave Hef's room, right? And the next morning I went down to the, the um, breakfast room where everybody sits and I'm sitting there in my white robe and talking to people. And I did it like for, for <laughs> probably a, two months straight. And then the only, only white robes come from Hef's room. All the other rooms, it, it was like wearing a neon sign, right? Right, that's I was in Hep's funny. Room last night and I had no idea, right? All the other robes in the bathhouses were all colored robes, blue, pink, red, orange, yellow. And the only the white robes came from Hef's room. And I said, <laughs> just sitting there thinking I, I, nobody knew I was still sneaking out of the room at night. And uh, yeah, then I just went down and wore that as I, and I said to Sandra, I said, when it, when I when I realized what it, what had, was going on, I said, Sandra, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you, like? I must have. She goes because I think it was better off not to say anything because you were. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, that that that's great. That's a great yeah. story. So there's there's um, uh, you know, it sounds to us like it, and and you know you'll kind of tell us how and why you decided to leave and move on with other things, but. Yeah. But it's, you know, uh, it sounds to me like you may have had a different experience than some of the other uh, women. I did. I, I'm, and um, I think that anybody that um, like Hep was really good to Sandra after they split up, he paid for her wedding reception, her dress. I mean, for years after that, she was always asking him for money. And, and Sandra has a, um, I don't want to say anything bad about her because I got I got put in Facebook jail and Instagram jail when I when I said something <laughs> about that 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 um, I didn't watch the program but I I watched a bit of it what what Sandra had to say and I was there like intimately with them for the last two years they were together and that stuff didn't happen I was yeah. present and accounted for I wasn't a third party I was wow. right there yeah so I mean. Now you you slept with Sandra and Hef at the same time, right? Wasn't that Hef's thing of having one or two or three girls at the same time? Um, yeah, that was yeah. his thing. I mean, yeah. that, that's it's not it's not new. I mean, it's been written about and, and talked yeah. about in documentaries. And, and when it, and then when the night was over, he'd always go down to a safe and he'd open up a safe and and he had a little book. And I said to Sandra, "What's he doing? What, what is he doing?" She goes. Well, he keeps a record of it in this book. And then I said, well, what does he say? And he said, she said, he just writes down who, 
who was there and then he actually he rates it i never saw the book like oh i never got no to look in the books no way mm-hmm. no who way is that book no i'm who kidding i'm not kidding now, i wonder i don't know Oh, I don't know, but there, was, there wasn't just one. I'm sure there was many yeah, yeah. <laughs> over the years. Oh, we need to get a hold of the rating book. I mean, wouldn't <laughs> yeah. you like to know? Did did Sandra know? She knew, yeah. She knew. Did she tell you? Did she give you an She's idea? She's the one who told me about the book. No, but did she know about at? your rating? Did she ever see what you were rated? It's funny, I never thought to ask her that. I never thought Well, let's call her and ask her. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> She'd love to hear from me. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it's it's kind of interesting for us to hear, you know, the other perspective, because mm-hmm. I think, you know, with all the news that came out about, uh, you know, how disgruntled many of the of the playmates and, and just people who hung around there were, uh, you know, I think for most of us, we expected a certain amount Funny, of... Funny, they never wanted to talk to us ones that weren't disgruntled, though, did well, they? Well, yeah, and that's the thing, is that, you know, there's always going to be two perspectives based on how well you fit in maybe and how well you didn't fit in and what I knew half really like I said intimately and he was my he was one of the best people I've ever met he was kind and thoughtful and kind of goofy he used to say groovy all the time I remember saying did you just say groovy (laughs) (laughs) Groovy. he he couldn't swim he couldn't drive he couldn't swallow pills he had to crunch them up into a and um, that's I could never figure out why his tongue was always orange, and it was because he was doing dextrin from ah. for years and years, right? Wow. What, what is he that? That's speed. The pharmaceutical yeah. speed. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah, but he was uh, doing it from from when he first started the magazine, right? But he was and, also. But he like couldn't what? swallow. He couldn't swallow pills, so he'd suck on them, and that's why his tongue was always orange. Huh. Yeah. He was he was uh, one of the first major executives of a company to hire women in executive positions mm-hmm. minorities i mean he was very well, Sammy Davis jr was the first black man on, on tv and was on playboy after dark right right right, right. Mm-hmm. so so now you eventually sort of wind down uh at at playboy and and why did that happen why was it that you decided you want you needed or wanted to move on um because that's when I first learned that nothing is ever what you think it's going to be, no matter what, it just isn't. And uh, I got really um, disillusioned with, uh, I kind of felt like um, nobody really cared. I mean, not half, but, but other people that they were kind of like a commodity and it was always people, what you could do for them or what they could do for you. And that I just wanted to go home and, and have that feeling of people that really loved me for who I was, but then I went home and you can't go home again, right? Right. right. So I got that when I went back home. It was really a weird feeling, right? I was like, and then, it's then, me, and then it's then just Kelly from Coquitlam, right? It's just yeah, yeah. me, you guys. It's just me. And they all they kind of looked at they looked, they looked at me different. Were they were they jealous of you? I don't think they were jealous. They were um well, you're now a celebrity. I mean, why wouldn't they be a little jealous? Mike's jealous right now. I'm jealous of Larry. <laughs> I don't know why. I just I am. No, but no, but so so yeah. I mean that that is you know in in so many things, you know for us it's like retirement uh, age, but for other people it's uh, you know particularly like child actors and stuff like that. When that lifestyle is gone, uh, it, it can it can have a couple of effects. One of them being sort of either depression. Uh, or f- a feeling of loss and not knowing what to do. So in your case, you get back there and then all of a sudden you kind of get in with the wrong crowd. No, not right away. I, um, I, I toured with play. I did car shows and club openings and I did a, a lot of car shows, right? I did that for a year and then I met the keyboard player from Loverboy and um, I was with him for just over a year and they were doing their Keep It Up tour. So I went from Playboy to Love Appropriate, Boy and, appropriate. Keep yeah, it up. yeah, and it was just, and it was the same lifestyle. It was Lear Jets and concerts all over the world. And uh-huh. um, then af- after that, um, I had my my first child. And um, between the two kids, then I, 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 well, I stopped. I stopped using. What, Part of the reason why I moved home was to get away from the cocaine too, right? Because I, it was fun in the beginning, but then um, 
and it was back in the, the early late 70s and early 80s when cocaine was really good yeah it was and it was like that movie what was that one with um scarface low low oh low low. yeah yeah it was just like that yeah and but i wanted to get away from it and then i then i came back to vancouver and it was like it was free down in california and vancouver was like 200 dollars a gram and and it wasn't very good and i ended i I stopped using it and in i think it was the year before my first son was born and i didn't do anything for about seven years um it was after my second son was born that i I kind of took the nosedive. And what happened? Why? I married Nick Hebler, who's a, um, he's an all-time all-star great football player. I married him after he had uh, retired though. And um, we got married after we were together for about six months. And then we moved to Kelowna up in the, where you guys were in Okanagan. We bought a house up there and um, I got pregnant right away with Hayden, my youngest son. And uh, we were there about a month, I guess. And I went to the grocery store to buy some food and he gave me the bank card. And I went to take money out and there was like $300 in the account. And our, that was when mortgage rates were like at 19%. We were just, it was awful, right? And so I went home and I said, Nick, you have another bank account, right? And he says, no, why? And I says, well, because our mortgage payment's like $1,300 and I just took the last 300 out to buy groceries and what are we going to pay our mortgage with? And he says, oh, you don't need money to, I can't remember what he said. And I panicked and I, and I ran to, I got dressed up and I went down to the local, the pier pub. I don't know if they still have it up there in Kelowna. It's called, it was I, called I, the pier. Yeah. And I got a job waitressing and then I got him a job doing Monday night football. And then he got a job as a manager and then fired me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and um then we had our we had our son and um the revenue canada phoned and said that he owed a bunch of money in back taxes and they didn't care that we just had a baby and they didn't care that he wasn't working and so it it was um we had we were only married for together for about 18 months before I left right and it was after I left Nick that I started using um, speed. And it was that so that you could work? Um, it was, yeah, because it, it was, I was, we moved back down to the coast and I got another job waitressing and I was doing flower arrangements then with my mom. So I'd work at night and then after the bar closed, my mom and I would go and collect all these flowers. And then um, Nick was really good with getting up with the kids, but I was making flower arrangements until I had to go to work and, and I still had a lot of baby weight on me, which was was hard to get off. And somebody offered me some in, a, in the bar I was working at. And I said, I don't know. I think you better do a little bit of research on it. And it wasn't crystal meth back then. It was just the biker speed. Yeah. And it was actually legal under the Food and Drug Act. If you got caught with it, they couldn't arrest you. They would just hmm. dump it out, right? Yeah, it was it was legal. And uh, this is in Canada. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I was in the in the late '90s when they they made it illegal. Actually, when it turned into that crystal meth, that's when they they actually made it illegal, and it and it got out of hand for everybody, right? So, so your drug use kind of escalated after mm-hmm. that, correct? Yeah, and, and then I and then moved to a bad part of town, and um, and did you have the kids at the time? Actually, um, my oldest son, um, I gave I let his dad. I wasn't. I, the, my kids' dads are the best dads, and they're really good men. And uh, Wally, I just gave Dylan to him because I, I I knew I couldn't take care of him properly. I was moving a lot, and then Dylan would had to go to different schools, and um, and Nick got custody of Hayden, and uh, then it got worse for me right after after I lost my kids. I did see them all the time though, like every weekend, and but I. They didn't have custody of them. What happens to a beautiful woman who has, like you're saying, two great guys um, and two great kids? What happens to you to make you go hang out with, and you're going to about to tell us Hell's Angels and the wrong crowd? What were you thinking back then to make you do that? I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, 
that's my dog. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. And it, it just got into this life. I got into this lifestyle and it's not so much the just the drug, it's a lifestyle that's that you have to get away from too. You can't just <laughs> stop the drugs. You have to get away from the lifestyles and addiction too. Well, that addiction, it I was, mean, the, the yeah. amount of dopamine that your brain was processing at the time, I'm sure just you weren't thinking about anything else other than drugs yeah. and yeah. where I could get it. And the crowd that you were hanging around with yeah. was using yeah, right? and, well we were making it too right so we didn't have to worry about where i was getting it from <sighs> Shh, it's my dog um let, let me ask you sorry let, larry you want to ask a question here or do you want me to continue because no, well, there was a lot of abuse that we understand because uh we've been reading some excerpts uh, from bill crow's book that's going to be coming out hopefully very soon our about book. you um, <laughs> yeah and book. by the way it's called tough our book enough. yeah it's tough called enough. what well, just I just, I wanted just to call it tough, but the, he went with, he, he, I don't know, it got changed to tough enough, but it's okay. Tough enough. But, yeah. you know, um, I read about the abuse. I mean, what happened? I don't know. I don't, I honestly don't know. I, it's hard for me to, doing the book was really good for me. And, and it was really difficult because I've always just kept going. I just kept going and, and never stopped to look back. And when I did the book was the first time I actually stopped and reflected on my life and, and, and actually went, went through it. And there wasn't a, in the two years it took us to, to write it, it, there wasn't one time that we could, were working on the book that I didn't break down in tears. And so, I, I don't cry because I'm not a pretty crier, right? So I, I, really, I don't cry. Who but is? I cried who every is? time. Yeah, who really is? No, I'm an awful crier. There's some girls that are so pretty when they cry. You know, again, uh, in uh, Bill Crow, who is the co-author of, of your book. Um, it, I used to clean Bill's house, him and Carol. That's what I'm getting at, is that you were, you were cleaning his house, which is how he met you. Yeah. Uh, and kind of like for the final time, you, you sort of disappeared for a while. And at that time you were on Vancouver Island from what I understand. And you were kind of house sitting where people yeah. were um, uh, dropping drugs off and picking them up later. And they wondered where you had gone. Uh, and then from the came... States to the Canada and a, yeah, a, exactly. a waterway exactly. there. Yeah, on but, boat. But, there, but there did come a time, and this is one of the key stories that we want to talk about, where you met this woman named Tina. Uh, why don't you tell us about her and how that happened and how that ultimately changed your life? Well, I stopped, I stopped using before I met Tina. I was in, I went into um, recovery. I think it was 2004, 2000, beginning 2005. And, um, but I still dabbled in it. Like I, I broke away from those, those people and um, I was cleaning houses and I, for Bill and other people. And, I, I did like that time when I broke away from him for a, a while. And then I got back on board, um, straightening my life out again. And then I met Tina. Um, I was staying uh, at a friend. I used to go out with this guy that owned uh, uh, a pub. I actually owns a couple pubs in the lower mainland. And we saw each other for a little while and we broke up, but we remained friends over the last 30 years. And uh, he lives in a big mansion on this, exclusive part of Langley and this girl's came over she lived across the street but there's there's like 10 mansions there but nobody really knows each other they have all gates and <laughs> cameras and nobody talks to anybody but she uh, was looking for a dog and she came over with her little girl and her little girl Lily that's my granddaughter's middle name is Lily looked exactly like me when I was her age I mean, exactly. I was really creepy seeing a little girl. I went, oh my God, that's me. When, and I, it, we introduced ourselves to each other and we were talking. And I said, your little girl looks just like me. And I went and got my baby book and I said, look. And uh, we actually left the book, the photo album at her house and her mom saw it. And she goes, where'd you get these pictures of Lily? They're so old, right? <laughs> they were old pictures. And I said, that's me. And she had a son named Dylan and I have a son named Dylan. She even had a cat named Kelly. And Ooh. yeah, it was like, it was like, it was like God wanted us to meet. And she was very, uh, she was a spiritual girl. She was Christian and um, had a lot of turmoil with her family. And 
uh, I was supposed to clean her house for her. And I went across the street to meet her and she'd gotten in a car accident, just a small one. Her, her nephew hit her in a parking lot. They were going like five miles an hour. And she said her back was really sore. And uh, anyway, a month later, I ended up moving into her cottage on the property and her back was getting worse and worse. And uh, her doctor was away for the summer. And I thought she'd like got a herniated disc because that's what I had gotten. And it went away and it came back. And then I had to have back surgery. And I says, well, you really need to get to the doctor. We found out she had cancer. And then 10 days later, she died. Wow. Oh. So I only knew her for for six months and I'd never in all like I mean I think I was I was in my 50s because she was 45 she was only 45 when she died 45 or 42 I can't remember wow. I had nobody close to me had died and people I knew had died but nobody close to me and it devastated me it just I was just it was just awful it was just just awful and I remember she, I, I was always been, I think like I did flower arrangements. And my other medium was actually wood. I can, I don't know if you can get a, you can't get a shot of it, but I used to do it just as a hobby and make gifts for people and give it away. And she goes, I just, she came down to the cottage one day and she goes, I just love your work. Can you draw? And I said, no, I can't draw. And she goes, well, have you tried? And I said, yeah, I tried like everybody else. Everybody wants to draw. Right. And then she goes, well, maybe you should take lessons. I said, Tina, I can't draw. That's why I don't color with Lily. I don't even color in coloring books. Hmm. And I remember that conversation because um, I, I went back. I could, I, the property was being sold and um, it was just, I didn't want to stay there anymore, even though that was part of it. She said, I want Kelly to stay here as long as she can. And I just couldn't stay there. So I went back across the street and I was staying with Mark until I got another apartment. And it was three months to the day after she died and Mark had gone to bed and there was an envelope beside the, I was sleeping on the couch and there was an envelope and a pencil beside the couch. And I, my dog was sitting in front of me and I grabbed it and I just, and I sketched my dog. And it was and like, why did you do that? I don't know why I did. I think because I hadn't, I had no creative outlet for the last three months. I was yeah. just mourning, mourning her death. Right. And and then I, I was like, I went, oh my God, I can't believe how good that looks. And I, I looked around the room and there was a picture of Mickey Mouse on the wall. So I, I sketched Mickey Mouse and it looked really good too. And I got all excited and I, and then I fell asleep and Mark got up in the morning and he used to doodle, right? And he said, he got up in the morning, he looked at it and he goes, did you have somebody over here last night? And I said, no. And I said, why? And he goes, well, who drew that? And I said, I drew it. It's good. Huh? And he goes, you drew that. And I said, yeah, I drew that. And he goes, draw something right now. So I sketched him and my sketches back then weren't very good, but to me, I could, I, I all of a sudden, I, they, people say that, um, people that can draw, they, they see things differently. And I kind of got that. I, all of a sudden I could, I was looking at, at things differently than I used to because I wanted to sketch, right? Mind you, I put in like thousands and thousands of hours of practice since then. And uh, anyway, Mark took that piece of paper and locked it in a safe, and I haven't seen it since, right? That little piece of paper that I drew those sketches on. And um, so I started drawing, and then uh, about, and I remember that conversation that I had with Tina. Can you draw? And I said, No, I can't. Well, maybe you should. And that would be something that Tina would do when she could have an. I think that's how I feel that she sent me a gift from heaven. Yeah, it's mm. awfully coincidental. We used to talk right. about, we talk about God and, and I, my, I didn't, my belief about it wasn't, I never went to church. I hadn't read the Bible, all that stuff. Right. And she never forced it down my throat. She just would talk about it. And I says, well, you know, I, I know I'm a good person and I know if there's heaven, I'm going to go to heaven, but it's probably going to be the pork and beans part of heaven. And you're going to be in the Beverly Hills part of heaven. <laughs> so when you get there, we, we didn't know she was dying. Right. You can send me an invite or a day pass so I can come and visit you, right, Tina? And we laughed. And um, so I know that that's something that what Tina would, because she believed in God. There's no doubt that there was just, she was going to meet God. And um, so, and then all of a sudden I could draw. And I know that's something that Tina would do just to seal it for me. And, and to know that sometimes I can still hear her voice in my head, I, sometimes I feel like she's, 
she's right beside me, right? And do you, do you think, um, well, first of all, you need to get Mark to give you back the envelope <laughs> that you first drew on. Okay, yeah. you're gonna need to get that yeah. back. And we'll, we'll put a plug in there for you. Um, but do you think this art has saved you, has kept absolutely, you? Absolutely, absolutely. You know? Because I didn't know what I was gonna do with, my, I was at that point where I was starting to dabble in the drugs a bit again. And, and I didn't really, I mean, I didn't want to clean for the rest of my life, be clean lady. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And at that, in your in your 50s, right, it was getting pretty grim, right? And, you know, the pickings were good a long time ago. It wasn't getting any better. And that it, it definitely saved me. It, it changed my whole life. It's what I live and breathe for. And it's like, it's like my new drug, I guess. I mean, right? those well, are hand-drawn yeah. pictures behind you, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's Tom your Petty, work. John Belushi. I mean, it's uh, amazing. Wood Mac, yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing. And you do you do commissions for other people of pictures that they want, right? A family. Yeah, and actually, animal. Tina's the one that got me on um, on Facebook too, right? And she before she before she died, and um, but I had I wasn't drawing then, right? She just said, "Oh, look at they're selling your magazine on on and and I didn't know how to work a computer, and yeah so that's well and you have an instagram page that everybody needs to go to we're going to put it up there it's mm -hmm. kelly.tough.art on instagram and if you want she's got a whole collection uh there's the, one of the latest ones is is the joker in color i mean yeah i just started using color recently. yeah i mean it, they're, they're absolutely stunning Thank for you. somebody who didn't start off as an artist yeah. Uh, and, and, I think, and how uh, old were you? You were in your 50s when you started? Yeah, I think I was, um, well, I'll be 61 in a couple of months and I've been drawing for about seven years. Yeah. You're a you're a menopause. We we woman. say you're a menopause man, but in this case, you are definitely a menopause woman mm -hmm. because you're Thank following you. your passion later in life. You hit 50 and what are you going to do next, right? Yeah. And so you're following uh, that pattern of, of just following your passion. And it's just, it's awesome. So yeah. how can people buy your, or buy, can they contact you through Instagram? If yeah, there's a piece through they Instagram see? Instagram until I get a web page together. Yeah, um, yeah through Instagram or Facebook. Yeah. And definitely, I do a lot definitely of commission there. work. The, the work that you see behind me is what I, I like to draw, right? And yeah. I love faces. I love, even my work with wood was always about faces. Yeah. And um, yeah, they can get in touch. I'm, I'm always on that there, like throughout the day. So if they yeah. leave me a message and. Yeah. Well, you know, you are, you are an inspirational story for, for menopause.com and the, the men and women that follow it, because, you know, we all face adversity Fortunately, for most of us, it's not as dramatic as yours, mm -hmm. but there's a there's a lot less severe stuff that knocks people down forever. And you didn't let that happen. You got back up, you rose like a phoenix, and now you're, you know, you're really excelling in in this field. And I think it can only get better. And that's why you got to get that website up. But yeah, I'd like it, really uh, like to get a manager too. would be great too. Yeah, I, well, I and of course, <laughs> I think when when your book comes out, um, I know that Bill and you are working on trying to get a publisher and stuff like yeah. that. And we, by the way, think it would be an amazing movie. Amazing um, movie. So that I'm sure he's working on some angles with that because we know he has some contacts in hollywood yeah he but, does he does um but uh yeah so you know kelly thank you so much for doing thank this thank you for having um, me it, you, you have a fast i'm so nervous story. about this about doing this because i always i just always stick my foot in my mouth right and no like, i you know oh, you, you definitely were, did you guys not are do great that. you, were, you great. were great and your dogs behaved i know you didn't <laughs> think so my roommate's sitting uh, inside their cage right now <laughs> But uh, no, it, uh, you did a great job and, and we were so happy to have the opportunity. And once your book gets closer to publication, we are also, we're starting a menopause.com book club in November. Oh. And hopefully when your book uh, comes out, we can feature it and interview you again about I'd the book. I'd love that. I'd love um, that. But again, thank you so much for, for this amazing story that you've been able to tell. And I think a lot of people are going to be inspired by it. Thank you so much. Yes, for thank me. you. All right. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Bye. <laughs>